Hi and welcome. This time around, rather than focusing on a project, although I will do a minor one to make a mandrel for these annular cutters right here using this stock, I thought I'd cover a topic that's very important to machinists, a topic that machinists will run into many different forms during their careers, threading. The first question we have to ask ourselves is why are threads important and why are they considered one of the greatest advancements of human engineering? In a simplified form, threads take advantage of an inclined plane to apply pressure. Threads allow a fastener to apply a potentially immense pressure between screw bolt head and nut, all the while requiring only a fraction of that force to tighten initially. As a bonus, friction can do a fairly good job of keeping the nut in place. In environments with large temperature swings or lots of vibration, other solutions like lock washers, Belleville washers, which are cupped washers or spring washers, um, or nylock nuts, are required. When you tighten a nut against some parts, like these washers, that you are attempting to fasten together, the force that is applied to the parts is mostly due to the stretching of the fastener bolt or screw, and a small part due to the compression of the parts themselves. It may seem obvious, but it is, it is an amazing advancement that you can use a simple fastener to make a bunch of individual parts act as if they were one, like this whole assembly here. Looking at this set of threads, you notice the slope. That is called the lead angle. The shallower the slope, or the higher the thread count in threads per inch, or smaller fractions of a millimeter per thread, for metric, the greater mechanical advantage while tightening. The trade-off is similar to one you get with gears, in that you have to complete more rotations of the nut to achieve the same tightening forces. So now you know you want to make a thread, how would you actually achieve that? Well, there's a bunch of ways to do it. So let's start with the least accessible to the home machinist, which are the industrial methods. So you can roll threads onto a shaft, and that's basically taking two different uh, dies and rolling them against each other with the thread grooves cut in them, and you put the shaft between them, and you roll them across the threads. You only have to go 360 degrees, and you roll the threads onto the shaft. Not very accessible. Another way is thread milling on a CNC machine. It's actually using a cutter that has the form of a thread on it and having the CNC machine follow the path that the thread would uh, thread needs to go. And then we get down to manual methods uh, that are accessible to the machinist. Here is a very large tap and a very large die and you basically have the appropriate hole or the appropriate shaft and you rotate these around it. They have a little bit of lead in where the threads are incomplete. It lets you lead the uh, die in this case onto them or in this case the tap, lead the tap into the hole and they progressively cut until you've got a full form, fully formed thread and uh, that is a very common way to make threads. Another way to make threads is on the manual lathe, and we're going to go over a bunch of different methods to that, including one is how you can thread to a shoulder. So if you're coming this direction, this is a shoulder. So as the tool approaches the shoulder, if it keeps going, obviously it's going to run into it, causing a crash. So I will show you a way to make it so that you never have to worry about crashing into a shoulder. So when you want to look up types of threads, you could just delve right in the machiner's handbook, but sometimes this book has so much information, it's actually hard to find what you need. So I tend to mark pages I use a lot, like this table here of UNF and UNC and UNS threads um, with all their major diameters and minimum diameters and pitched diameters. I need those numbers quite often, so this is a handy way to do it. But when you're trying to look through a bunch of different thread forms, uh, this book, although useful, and it's all there, and a lot more, uh, is kind of difficult to weed through. Instead, I uh, will normally jump for the Engineer's Black Book. This is a special Barzi Bash edition. Uh, pretty fantastic. They gave me one of these when I went to the Bash. It's pretty awesome. Uh, it's also an extra large version for my eyesight. They have a smaller version and the bigger version. Um, the beauty of this is that... Uh, this guy has all the thread forms and tables for every thread forms in it, and it's much easier to find. You can see that it didn't take long to flip to it before I found the various thread forms right here and the tables associated with them. So looking at the thread forms directly, there are a ton of variations of thread forms. So many that uh, you kind of make your head spin. Fortunately, almost all the threads you will run across in normal day life are the metric uh, ISO threads for a good portion of the world and the UNC and UNF threads uh, in the United States. 
At first glance, you'll notice that the two most common thread types, UNC, UNF, and metric ISO threads, are all 60 degree thread forms. But that's not the only thread angle out there by any stretch. There's a lot of very strange thread forms out there. Let me walk you through a few of them. All right. So another thread type you might be familiar with as a machinist is an Acme thread because most lead screws are Acme threads. Uh, a lot of times we call them trapezoidal, but there's a separate form called trapezoidal that has a slightly different shape. Uh, the, this thread type has a 29 degree angle instead of a, um, a 60 degree angle like the threads we're used to. Uh, some threads, um, like the stub Acme is a variation on the Acme where it's shorter. Uh, you have buttress threads which are, are stronger on one side than the other and specifically designed when the force will only go one way on a fastener. Uh, you have the API threads where they're round on the bottom. Uh, you will notice that um, there are sharp threads that go straight to the bottom. Uh, most threads tend to have a squared off bottom like the metric threads and the, the UNC and UNF threads are squared on the bottom because if you cut a, a sharp point into a fastener, it's actually weaker. So the strongest fasteners will be ground or they will use a, a full form uh, thread cutting tool, which we'll get into later, that will already have the tip squared off so that they don't cut a sharp point and weaken the fastener because you've got you create stress risers at sharp points you will notice that when you come up to a shoulder uh, a lot of machinists will put a radius corner in, or it'll be specified in the drawing to have a radius uh, radius shoulder corner on the shoulder and the whole point of that is to prevent stress risers from creating in this case this double rounded form uh, allows to have better seal at high pressures so the oil industry uses those um, there's some other weird this api buttress thread here British standard gas. Um, here's some British pipe threads. Here's a 90 degree form, thread form, Hughes H90. I've never heard of that one. Thread form, um, dry seal. Haven't seen that one before either. Uh, there's a metric tape, taper thread form, national pipe threads. NPT threads are uh, right here and they're pretty common. You notice that's a pretty sharp point. Uh, not great for strong thing, but uh, anyways. Uh, here's a German one for steel conduit, specifically, 80 degree thread form. Here is a round thread form using pipe couplings and fire protection, round on both sides. Um, and here's the trapezoidal, which is a slight variation on the Acme, and a sawtooth thread, 30 degree form. This trapezoidal is 30 degree form. The Acme is a 29 degree form. <laughs> yeah, try and get your head around that, but again, the only two threads you're going to run across most of the time uh, is UNC, UNF in the United States and metric internationally. Here I have a side view of a sample set of threads. And you notice the first thread is triangular shaped. That would be the full thread form if they didn't cut off the tops and bottoms of the thread so that the top didn't bend over and the bottom didn't have a really uh, potent stress riser. So normal threads don't have a sharp top or a sharp bottom. Uh, they may have a rounded form like between three and four, but uh, traditionally uh, squared off on top um, and squared off in the trough as well. Uh, the number of threads per inch or the thread or the number of threads per inch is you just count the number of threads. You'll see t 10 here in the drawing and this is one inch wide. So this is, exa is an example of 10 threads per inch. The thread pitch is one over the number of threads per inch or one over 10 or one tenth of an inch. Now the the form of the, that first triangle, the 60 degree triangle, is important because that is an equilateral triangle and all sides of an equilateral triangle are equal and that'll be useful in calculating the height or the depth that you have to penetrate with your tool to cut that thread. We'll get into more of that in a second. Uh, one thing to know is that the proportions between the thread uh, peaks and troughs are on the left side of the drawing. So knowing that height, once we calculate it, uh, the, the thread itself is only 0.625 of that height. The top of the thread gets cut off 0.125 and the bottom of the thread gets cut off by a quarter. And that makes for a strong, useful thread. So the thread shape is based on 60 degree angle and that forms a 60 degree uh, equilateral triangle, as I mentioned before, and all sides of the triangle are equal to the thread pitch. 
And that gives you a very useful uh, starting point to figure out the height of that triangle, which shows you how deep a tool needs to penetrate, especially if it's a sharp tool to create the thread. So if you drop a vertical to get the height of that triangle, uh, in the second drawing, you'll see that it's the square root of three. That's because it forms a 30, 60, 90 triangle because the top is divided directly in half. That was 60 degrees, which now makes the one triangle 30 degrees. So 30, 60, 90 right triangle. And the ratio of the sides is one to two to the square root of three. Two is your thread pitch. One is half your thread pitch, or the bottom side is half that thread pitch. And the vertical is square to three times half your thread pitch. And if you look at the third drawing, the shortcut to that is just 0.866 times your thread pitch. And that gives you the height of the thread or the depth you need to penetrate if you have a sharp universal cutter, like uh, we'll show you soon when I start going over tools and inserts. And that tells you how far you need to go in. And then what you do is you'd file off the top of the threads. And unfortunately, the bottom would be sharp. Uh, most hobbyists, when they're cutting threads and not using a full form tool, uh, do create sharp bottom threads, which is not ideal, but it tends to be plenty functional. Uh, you could uh, flatten off the top of your tool for each specific thread pitch. Unfortunately, that uh, height it varies by thread pitch. So you could just modify your tool to get a proper bottom but if you don't then you need to go in the full height of this triangle to make a proper thread and this shows you how to get that now that we know about threads and thread forms what tools do we have available to cut threads on a manual lathe since i'm assuming if you're watching my channel you're not a cnc machinist because uh, you'd have a lot more options available to you and i don't have access to one so i can't uh, use them either so let's start with the most ubiquitous and most flexible of all cutting tools. It is a piece of high-speed steel. With high-speed steel, you can cut any thread form you can imagine, including some that don't exist. Uh, it has incredible versatility. Uh, they can be very sharp. They can be universal, like this 29-degree custom thread form uh, tool I made for a customer's project. This is a neutral tool, comes right down the center. And uh, you could even do a full form uh, thread cutting tool. If I just had not ground away a section here that would stick out as a flat, it would also cut the uh, flats on the top of the threads rather than having to use a file at the end. Uh, you could, so that as opposed to a general purpose, you can make it only for one thread pitch. Um, so high speed steel, incredibly versatile. Next up is brazed carpide, which has the advantage of longer cutting life. Uh, it has the disadvantage of being completely non-versatile. Uh, you're, you're forced to whatever thread form the uh, piece of carbide on the end is shaped as. Uh, they can be very sharp these days. In the old days, high-speed steel could get sharper than carbide, but now with micro-grain carbides, you can get these fairly sharp as well. Uh, maybe not quite as sharp as high-speed steel, but pretty darn close. Um, this is also a neutral rake. You could have had a right-handed cutter or a left-handed cutter uh, with the carbide as well, but in order to have that, you'd have to buy it that way. And once you've bought it, you can't change it uh, very easily without brazing on a new piece of carbide and reshaping the tool. So essentially, it's dedicated. Next up is insert tooling, and I'll start with the Stranger uh, insert tooling, or the less common. These are made by, made by Thinbit, and they use uh, some bits over here that slide in. And these actually are biased a little bit. So this is a right-handed uh, bit, and it can either fit in this way, in this tool, for cutting an inside uh, thread, or it can fit on this tool for an outside thread. And again, you're limited to the thread form and the pitch range of whatever the carbide was uh, cut for, or ground for, in the case of carbide. I guess not cut. Uh, so this is a very unusual one. You don't see these a lot in the home hobbyist. Uh, I found these used and uh, picked them up. They're pretty handy because there's a whole bunch of other inserts that fit in these that will do grooving, although that's pretty common for threading tools in general. The next tools we have here are some of the most common found in the home workshop uh, for manual uh, thread cutting, and that would be the laydown tool where the insert lies flat. Uh, this is in a negative rake setting, but the insert itself is tipped up to make it a positive rake cutter, which takes less force uh, on the machine and uh, cuts a little more freely than a negative rake, but may not have as good a surface finish. 
This is a right-handed tool, and this is a left-handed tool. And this, if you're using it in a normal thread form, would be to come up to a shoulder that's on your left. So it's an SER, which means external threads, right-handed, 20 millimeter height here, uses a 16 ER uh, external laydown thread insert. And this would be designed to come from the, le from the right to the left. That's why it's called a right-handed tool. So it's moving from the right towards the headstock, and it can come up to a shoulder on its left. The left-handed tool can come up to a shoulder on the right, and it comes from the left or from the headstock away from the headstock. And uh, that is an advantage. We can also use this differently. Uh, this is a boring bar, and this is an SNL. It's a left-handed bo boring bar, and it uses a smaller lay-down threading insert. They have three, they have three different uh, cutting tips on them, so they're very useful, and they are limited by the fact that you need the proper th thread form in the insert. Now, they do make a, a universal sort of uh, thread, which is the uh, uh, thread cutting tool, which is the 16ER AG60. And that cuts a range of threads. It's not a full form thread cutting tool. Uh, I'll show some inserts in a minute. And the inserts dictate what range of threads or only one specific pitch of threads it can cut. Uh, so this is a very common set of tools and uh, they work pretty well. Some of them have a carbide anvil. Some of them don't. Uh, these both do, but I have some here. Here's one that doesn't have a carbide anvil, just goes on the base steel. The carbide's stiffer and a very flat surface, but I'm not sure if it's really advantageous because when that carbide chips, then you have to find one of those anvils, and that's a big problem trying to find them quite often. Um, someone who knows more about this might be able to tell you uh, why that carbide anvil is so superior, but uh, I've had pretty much equal results with, uh, with cutting tools with and without a carbide anvil. Lastly, uh, of tools I have, is the vertical mount uh, carbide insert threading tool. And this one's a carboloy, and I don't see these very often anymore. I don't think these are as popular. I might be wrong about that. You could let me know in the comments. Uh, but I don't see these anywhere near as much, especially sold on eBay or places like that. Uh, I'm not sure if they have gone out of favor, but again, like I said, I don't see these very often. Again, you're limited to the form that the carbide is shaped in, so you're restricted. It's not a universal tool, and if you don't have the insert, if you have a carbide grinder, you could try and grind some carbide, but the shapes are pretty custom that fit in here, so you'd have a bit of work to do to make a, a custom tool. You could take an existing and modify it, perhaps. Uh, since we're going on to inserts next, I'll show you some inserts for these guys. Here is a radius uh, grooving tool that fits in there. And this is a slotting tool uh, for the side of uh, a part. And this one is a radius tool, which is kind of interesting. I don't know if you can see that, uh, but it's got a little radius cut in the side there. In the same style of cutting tools, we have this much larger vertical style thread cutting tool. And the reason I'm showing this is because with these inserts, there's enough meat on them that if you have a carbide grinding uh, capability, you could make your own form out of this and uh, make a custom thread form or a custom grooving tool out of it as well. So also pretty versatile. There's a lot of relief underneath these. So uh, you'd be a little bit restricted, but uh, still a, more flexibility than you might otherwise have. Certainly more flexibility than this style tool, which there's really nothing you can do about this. Whatever inserts you have here is what you can do. Here's a, a small selection of laydown threading inserts I have. I bought a lot of these on Ebay's and gotten them in lots. Things like this 55 degree that you wouldn't run across very often. Let's take a closer look and let's start with the closest to universal threading laydown insert for standard threads like UNC, UNF, and metric. So this is the 16IR60, and it's good for either internal threads or a left-handed tool. And you'll see that the tool is designed, I don't know if you can see that, so that the cutting edge is actually at a positive rake. So even though the tool may have a negative rake, uh, the holder has a negative rake, so it's lying like this, they put enough of a slope on it to make it a positive rate cutter. Now this tool, this set of inserts will do a range of threads. So in metric, it'll do 0.5 to three millimeters pitch threads and in standard eight to 48 pitch threads. And here I have some standard, I think this is Whitworth, but uh, 55 degree external threads. And this came in a lot of tools I've got, I've never had a use for it, but maybe someday. 
Here is a smaller standard of that uh, uh, ER60 style tool. And these are 11, this is the next size down, 11 ERA60. This is the ER version uh, relative to the IR. So if you want to see these side by side, let's, uh, let's take a look at that. And you'll just know that, that the cutter goes from the opposite side. So here's the ER, here is the IR. And you can see that they're just uh, molded uh, sort of 90 degrees apart, I guess that is. Yeah, 90 degrees apart. Next up, we have these 16ER10RD, which stands for round threads. These are for API 10 thread per inch only round threads. And the reason why they're limited to 10 threads per inch is because they're a full form threading insert. So you'll notice the rounded bottom that cuts the bottom profile and the rounded part on top that cuts the top of the thread profile because you're not going to be able to file a round thread uh, profile easily into threads all, all the, over the entire uh, product. So, and because this has a fixed depth here between the root and the peak of the thread, this is dedicated to 10 threads per inch only. And they have these in the standard uh, UNF threads as well, or metric style threads, the ISO threads, where the trailing bit cuts the top of the thread and the pointy part cuts the root of the thread. Next, I have another full form thread cutting tool. This is a 16 ER6. So this is for six threads per inch. And this is for Acme threads focus. And again, you will see that the pointy part cuts the root of the thread while the top part is cut by the little relieved section here, if I could get this to focus. So you'll see that the, this is a full form threading tool again. So it's dedicated to six threads per inch. Uh, the peak part with the flat cuts the root of the thread and the top of the thread is cut off by this section. And when this starts to touch and gets to proper depth, you're done. And as I was discussing before for the lay down style tools, here is one of the replacement anvils. They're really hard to find. Uh, they're only, they're sided as well. So they're either IR or ER style. And uh, trying to find one that fits your particular tool is really challenging. So that for me is a, is a big a bit of a problem. So that covers tools pretty well, I think. Uh, there are some tools I didn't cover here that I can't use uh, and or that I don't have, but they'd be variations on a theme. So hopefully this will give you a start. Next, let's take a look at machine controls. Now I realize that my lathe will be different than other people's lathes, but there will be a lot of things in common too. So let's take a closer look and hopefully it'll be helpful. Starting at the top, we have the speed controls here and here. And I noticed between lathes, those vary significantly. So the actual you know, relationship between these and speeds is not really important. What is important to know that it goes from 70 to 1800 RPM. And that when you're threading, you're usually threading in the lower speed range. But I do find that the faster you go, the better the quality of the finish is. Now, I don't know if that's an absolute truth, but just in my experience, that seems to be the case. However, uh, when you're threading to a shoulder, uh, if you run into that shoulder, you crash. So you're typically going slower. So you've got time to disengage the half nut and ca not cause a crash. After speed, everything else here, all these controls and all of the controls down below are to set the relationship between the spindle and the lead screw, both speed and direction. So coming over here, we have low and high. That's a low and high range. And if you look at the tables here, here's metric and uh, English threads here and here. And you'll notice that you need to go to high range for the larger thread pitches. And what that means is you can't exceed 300 RPM, but for the lower ones, you could, and you could potentially get a better thread quality. Uh, for diametral pitch and modulus gear cutting, like worm gears, uh, they all require the high range, so you're going slow speed. And here is the feed and that controls the relationship between spindle rotations and how much the cross slide and saddle move. And you'll notice that those are low range mostly, except for the very fast range here, which is 47 thousandths a revolution up to 67 thousandths per revolution. Or for metric folk, 1.2 millimeters per revolution to 1.7 millimeters per revolution. The forward and reverse lever control the relationship between the direction of the spindle over here and the lead screw. So uh, in forward, 
that would be for right-handed threads in most normal operations. Reverse would be for left-handed threads. Down below, we have a bunch of switches and levers here, and those set up the, the gearing relationship between the rotation of the spindle and the lead screw again to get the right feed rate or the right thread pitch on the motion. And that pretty much covers the headstock. On the saddle itself, up top we have the tool holder and we have the compound. The compound w will be a discussion that causes a lot of conflict in the machinist community because there are some very strong opinions about this and I'll cover both opinions in just a minute. Going down below, the, this is my feed control for longitudinal cross feed and forward and reverse. These are only for feeds. When you're actually, when you're threading, you engage the half nut and this half nut grips around the lead screw right there and that draws this in at a very specific relationship to every rotation of the spindle over there. So this is the half nut location. On my lathe, if this thing goes down slightly, it locks out the longitudinal and cross feeds so they cannot be engaged. Finally, over on the side here, you've got my lathe direction control for the motor and this is the start. You push in and go up for forward and down for reverse and you have the threading dial. So the threading dial has a set of numbers and increments on it. And I put a piece of tape here with a mark on it just to pick a, a spot so that it was very easy to read because the marking on mine was not uh, very good. So in the back here is a gear that rides on the lead screw so that this stays in relation to the, the same to the lead screw at all times. And then you can look up your thread pitch here, same for metric and English threads, and you can find out where you can start. So if you look at the thread pitch here, uh, for 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, 20, 32, 36, etc., threads per inch, you can choose any position on the dial, so a whole number or a half, a half segment in between. Uh, for these thread pitches, it's a non-numbered position. For these thread pitches, it's a number of positions, one, two, three, or four. For these thread pitches that are fractional thread pitches, it's only specific numbers. And in this set of fractional thread range, it only does these specific pitches. Uh, for metric, that's interesting because it's not stated on here, but maybe you just look up the equivalent metric thread. I'm actually not sure. However, on this lathe, uh, you typically, if you're going to do metric lathe, since it has an English relationship lead screw, uh, you do not disengage the half nut. So when you, you stop by hitting the emergency brake and the brake on the lathe, and then you put the lathe in reverse and back up to the beginning of your part and cut again. And you never disengage the lead, through, lead screw once you started for metric. And maybe that's what they mean here. Uh, for metric, uh, you just leave it engaged. Now you can, if you're using the threading dial, you could disengage the lead screw, watch the dial very carefully, and it's hard to do at the same time as watching where the cutter is, uh, but I suppose you could disengage the lead, lead screw, stop the machine, then you could manually back up the spindle so that this threading dial goes back to the same position. Don't do, in a, don't do a whole loop or you're going to be in big trouble. You'll have to count the loops as well. Re-engage the half nut when you're back at the position you started at, then run the lathe in reverse, and that way you can disengage the half nut in metric threading uh, if you need to, especially if it's really close to a shoulder. So again, one more time. You come to the end of your thread, you disengage the lead screw really quickly, or the half nut, and you step on the emergency brake immediately, noting that what number this guy was on. Then you manually rotate the, the spindle to move everything back into place to get this guy in the reverse direction. So if it's whatever direction it's rotating, go the opposite direction, end up on the exact same number relationship that you were before. Make sure it doesn't do a full rotation or you're gonna have to do a full rotation plus that difference. Very hard to keep track of, especially when you're watching what you're doing. So back it up until the number that was on this position is in the same place, re-engage the half nut, then run it in reverse to the beginning, and you, that way you can disengage the half nut while you are threading metric threads. 
Next up is one of the most controversial topics on forums and boards about threading. And it's a really silly one in my opinion because it doesn't seem to make a lot of difference, but people have very strong opinions about it. And that is, what is the angle of your compound and whether you use your compound to feed in the amount of cut you're gonna do. The way I was taught in school and the way that seems to be most common is people put their compound at 29 and a half or 29 degrees, not 30, which is unusual, which is the half angle of the thread angle, and use the compound to put, to move your cutter in the amount of depth of the thread you're gonna go. And they use the cross slide to pull the cutter out at the end of the cut, back up, go back to the exact same point on this, and then you know that you're your relative starting position is identical, and then dial in some more cut on your compound. Second school of thought, have your compound at 90 degrees or leave it at 30 degrees, doesn't actually matter, you never move your compound. In that case, you, you use your cross slide to both set the depth of cut and come back to the same point every time. In that case, you've got to keep track where your cross slide is, and in that case, your cutter cuts symmetrically on both sides and takes an even cut. With the compound method of taking your compound at 29 or 29 and a half degrees, there's a lot less cutting on the right side of the cutter than the left hand side of the cutter. And I have had equal results with both, both approaches and I've never had an issue going straight in. A lot of people say it takes too much cut. In reality, you could just dial less cut in that way. It seems to me that going straight in might be better just slightly only because you're putting symmetrical load on your cutter. Uh, with the compound method, there's almost no cut on the right hand side and almost all of the cut happens on the left hand side. So if you're looking for total cutting force, you just dial in less if you're going straight in. Um, but it's six of one, half dozen the other. Like I said, both work perfectly fine. Another approach for the, for the straight in method, you put your compound at 90 degrees and you indicate it in and then you use your starting position on the cross slide and you dial in your cut on the compound. Although they tend to run into each other so it can work if all of your handles and everything are the right size. I find it gets very busy in here if you do that. Um, but in that case your compound would set the depth of cut and then this could come back to the same number every time your cross slide. So that's another approach. All right, well that covers most of the basics on this. So let's try some thread cutting. We're gonna try two approaches. We're gonna try the standard way I was taught, which is threading to a shoulder and disengaging the half nut over here quickly before you run into the shoulder in your zone of relief. And then I'll show you a method where you never have to worry about crashes. So now to make some threads. First, gotta figure out what my thread pitch is gonna be. So these are really handy, by the way. I have one in inch and one in metric. Uh, it's got male and female threads, and that way you can tell what your threads need to be. In this case, 5 16 24. So 5 16 24 means 24 threads per inch. The thread pitch is 1 over 24, or 0.042, which means the spacing between peaks is 0.042, which also means both these sides are 0.042. Drop that vertical to figure out how far I want my cutting tool to go in. And if this is 0 0.042, then half this side is 0 0.021. This side is square root of three times the short side, 0 0.021 times the square root of three, or 0 0.036. So that means my cutting tool needs to go in roughly 0 0.036, and then when I'm done, I cut off the tops, cut off the peaks here with my file. Uh, that's an eighth of the total thread height, uh, which would be an eighth of 0 0.036, but I usually do it by feel, so we'll do that. So allow me to correct that last statement by saying we don't want to go all the way in to generate a triangle. We want to stop leaving the top eighth flat. So as a result, that 0 0.036, which is the height, we want to multiply by seven eighths, which gives us 0 0.315 penetration of the tool radially, or multiply that by two, leaves us 0 0.063 inches, which is the total penetration diametrally, if using a DRO like I do, for the tool to penetrate into the work to give a proper thread. Next, we have our lathe settings. So first I set the speed to the slowest speed, so the low gearbox in A, which is 70 RPMs. Come down here, find 24 threads per inch, and it's LBS 6V. So I come down below, well first, there, this one's set to L. Here's B, S, 
Here's V and here's six. Now, if you don't have a quick change gearbox like I do, then you'll need to come around the side here, pop off the side and set the quick change gears appropriately for your lathe. So smaller mini lathes, that's what you need to do. Next up, we have our tool loaded. It's a lay down tool. We're gonna thread in a traditional manner here. I've got a relief behind the threads here somewhere for the tool to end without crashing into this and still uh, being clear of the thread. So uh, the clearance is a little bit deeper than the deepest thread should go. And we should all set there. Now the compound is currently set to 30 degrees or 29 and a half degrees but I'm not gonna use the compound. I'm just gonna go straight in. These are very small threads. So if I was gonna go and use the compound, I would set my compound at zero. Normally, I, like right now, my compound is set to be locked off so that it doesn't move at all. That's my normal operating. I have the compound completely locked off so it doesn't move. So in the mode I'm currently in, I'll be going in, setting my zero. Now I have a DRO, so that gives me a big advantage. So I can set the zero on the DRO here, and I know that is my zero point. And then anything I go beyond that is how deep the thread's gonna be. So that'll be easy. You could also do that with the dial, with the, the dial on your handle here. Fortunately, I don't have to do that, but remember that this is radial, and that is set for diametral. Uh, which is a big difference. If we were gonna use the other method, I would set this guy to zero, I'd unlock it. I would set this guy to zero. I would move this guy in until the cutter is just touching the work. Okay, so I'd bring this back here. I'd move this in until it just touches the work. Once I've got that at zero, then I would set this at zero while this is at zero. Then I would bring the cutter out. I would come back over. I would move the cutter into zero on this dial down here, and then I would put in my thread cutting depth on this guy. And then every time when I cut my thread, when I get to the end, I would disengage the half nut. I would pull the cutter out. Some people pull the cutter out, then disengage the half nut. Uh, that stops the motion, but you don't want to crash like it is now. And then you would bring the carriage back, clear of the work, bring this back into zero, dial in a little more cut on the thread and continue like that. We are not gonna do that method. We're gonna do what I first said, which is just using this dial alone, just going straight in. Doesn't matter where your compound's set because we're not adjusting that. And like I said, it's locked off so it can't move. I'm lucky enough to have a thread dial, which means that I can, I can know exactly where to engage the half nut. Now, if I was doing metric, I wouldn't use this at all. I would engage the half nut and leave it engaged at all times. So instead of, of disengaging the half nut to stop the motion, I would hit the emergency brake down here instead, pull the slide out, use the lathe in reverse to get my position back to out past the work. You know, either dial it in here or dial in a new cut here, depending on whether I was using the compound at 29 or I'm just going straight in like I'm going to do here. And then the half nut never gets changed. And then you put this back in and then you just put it in forward and a cut away. Uh, now, I told you about that other method where you can use, if you have a threading dial, you can disengage the half nut metric. It's probably not advised in normal circumstances, but if you keep track of where this started and then it moves a little, you know, as you disengage the half nut so the lathe's still turning, then you stop the lathe, then you manually turn your chuck back until the half nut position, until this threading dial position is right here, then re-engage the half nut, then reverse, etc. So you can do that. Uh, that's kind of hard and you're likely to set yourself for a problem. Since I have an imperial lead screw right here on this guy, that means I can use the threading dial. So the threading dial tells you based on the threads per inch, what positions are valid on the threading dial to engage the half nut. So, so I'm doing 24 threads per inch. That means any position, whole number, half number, any line will do. Now, if you were down here doing three and a quarter inch threads, there's only one position only. You pick a number, a whole number, and you've got to continue to use that number every single time. And same, and for two and seven eighths, never disengage the half nut <laughs> for those large thread pitches. So we'll come back to this later because this is one of the methods you can also use uh, to do multi-start threads, but we'll cover that later. All right, so when you're setting up your tool, you wanna to make sure your tool is perpendicular to the work. That's what one of these threading uh, gauges is for. 
However, for really small work like this, it is very hard to set your tool up using this because there's not a lot of uh, place for the tool to, to sit. For larger thread pitches, it's much easier. So you probably need to indicate off the side of your tool, hoping it's straight in, in order to make sure that uh, you're perpendicular because you want your, you want your threads to be in even 66, 60 degrees, 30 off each center. If it's turned a little bit to one side or the other, you're going to have your angle is going to be skewed and you will cut an incorrect thread. Next, to set my zero, I just walk the cutter in very, very slowly until it just starts to make a mark, and that's going to be my zero points. So you either set it on your in feed dial or, in my case, on my DRO, I zero my DRO. Now that I have my zero reference, I can dial in a little further since I'm using the straight in method. This only uses the cross slide. My compound is locked and I can do set myself up for a scratch pass. And I can engage the half nut anywhere. So you can see why I need it so slow. So now I'm at the end of the thread. I disengage the half nut so the, the carriage stops moving. I pull it out. I can wheel it back since it's not a metric thread. I bring my, cross, my uh, compound into zero. I mean, not my compound, my cross slide into zero. That's my zero point. And then I'm going to go in. I already went in 10 thousandths. My next cut will be another five. And we'll make that 15 thousandths. So my DRO reads minus 15 at the moment. But first, we're going to grab a ped thread pitch gauge and make sure that our threads are good because uh, we wouldn't want to go any further if my threads were wrong. I don't know if you can see this, but the threads line up nicely. They bite in, so that's a good start. Okay, so we're prepping to do another pass. So I turn on the lathe, I add a little lube. I've got my new thread cutting depth dialed in. Engage the half nut on a whole number in this case. I'm kind of far out. And we're at the end. I disengage the half nut. I bring the cross slide out, not the compound, so that the cutter clears. Clear the end of the cut. Go to zero. And I already went in 20. This is 20 diametrally. So we're going to go in 30. We're going to clear chips out of the way. We're going to add a little lube. Because threading is form cutting, so you need every bit of help you can get. I could stop on any line, but since I happen to be pretty close to one, we're just going to let ourselves go there. And I tell you what, I think I can do this a little bit faster. So I'm going to step it up to 110 RPM. It means I got to be a little more on my game. And clear. So I disengage the half nut, pull the cross slide out, go back. Cross slide into zero. And then I was at 30. And now we'll go to 40, which is essentially another five thousandths aside. We'll clear out the old chips. Make sure we add some lube. Wait till I hit a whole number. And engage the half nut. Now, the deeper you go with the threads, the smaller the cut each time you should take. So taking five thousandths radially aside for the first few is not a big deal. But by the time you get to the end, you're starting to take a bigger and bigger bite. And depending on what you're cutting and how delicate it is, that may be ill advised. All right, there was a pass at 60 thousandths. So now we can try and test fit. We're still three thousandths away. I'm going to do a spring pass here first, which is just a pass without taking off, without bringing the cutter in any further than the previous pass. So I shouldn't theoretically take off any material, but because of deflection, you almost always do, as you see right there, I just did. Okay. So normally if I'm trying to do precision fit, I'll do spring passes until no more material comes off as a, just for safety's sake. Holy cow. 
So that's a machine fit. So I stopped a full 10 thousandths before you should. So these threads are really large. Holy cow. I thought it was going to be tight for sure this time, but uh, that's actually a really good fit threads and that's at 60 thousandths. So there you go. <laughs> There's a good fit. What will happen is when you're undersized, You'll start the threads and they'll just either just barely start like half a turn or you'll get maybe one or two turns and then it'll start to get really stiff. Most likely um, you'll get just a part of a turn initially and as you go deeper you'll be able to go almost all the way in but it'll start to get really tight as more and more th threads engage each other and when you're finally there it should fit just like this because it's actually a really good fit. No wiggle at all. Also, another thing, while you've got the threads here, if you're having problems with the threads just sticking slightly, sometimes there can be a burr and you can just take a jeweler's file that's 60 degrees aside and just run the threads and clean up any burrs that might be in the path. All right, I promised you a solution where you wouldn't have to worry about crashing. You can go faster, which I am going to try and do here. So I've got my left-handed cutter installed upside down. Now, remember what I said, if you're doing a metric thread, you never engage the half nut. So you engage the half nut at some point in time, you cut the thread, you go in, then you back out with the cross slide and either you stop here with the emergency stop or you just pull your cross slide out then stop so that it doesn't crash the part and then you put the lathe in reverse come back out and start again now what i am going to do is we are going to run the lathe in reverse so we're going to start i've got my tool installed upside down on the center height we're going to come in i found my zero and you notice this time i've left a lot less a lot less clearance for the for the tool so it's it's just barely going to clear there's almost no relief in there at all and we're going to go in do my first pass but we're going to run the lathe in reverse and then engage the half nut and it'll cut on the way out instead of the way in which means there's no risk even going fast of crashing the cutter all right so we got to make sure we get the lathe in reverse which makes it sound different because it doesn't usually run reverse Engage the half nut, do my cut, disengage the half nut, come out, go back in so the cutter just barely clears. I'm going to dial zero on my DRO to find that. I'm going to dial in another 10 thousandths, engage the half nut, cut. I can add a little lube, come out to clear the cutter come to zero on my DRO so I don't have to think about it. Dial in a little more, another 10 thousandths. Engage my half nut, cut, come out. You'll notice how fast this is going. If I had to go the other direction with this shorter relief, I would crash for sure. No question. Got my zero. Gonna dial another 10 thousandths in. So here we are at 50 thousandths total depth. Cut, come out, clear, come back to zero. I first saw this on Joe Pizinski's channel and I couldn't believe it. We're gonna see it's at 55 thousandths. Engage the half nut, cut, come out. We're gonna go back. Now these threads are so loose on this thing, I am going to, uh, I'm going to stop at 55 and do a test. Let me dial in the same 55 and do a spring pass just to clear anything up. There we go. I'm going to come way out. Let's do a test fit. So remember I said about just beginning to start. Okay, see they're super tight. You can tell you need to dial a little bit more into that. You need to do another pass or two. So that was a 55 thousandths. I know that 60 was loose because these creds, threads are crazy oversized.
you just double check that again, make sure there's everything's clear. So that's, that's really tight. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna dial just another two thousandths in. So we're gonna come back to my zero, go to 57 thousandths. Normally when you get close, you wanna do a thousandth at a time, but this is really tight. So we're gonna do two thousandths. We're gonna go for 57 thousandths, 57. Make sure my lathe is in reverse. Add a little, add a little lube. Engage the half nut, cut, come back out. I'm gonna do a spring pass like I always do to make sure there's nothing that got missed. So your final passes should always be spring passes. 57, engage the half nut, cut. We're gonna clear. I'm gonna do another test fit. Okay, so it started loose, and as I go into the threads, they get tighter and tighter. But if you want a really good fit, you can get these threads on. Oh, nope, won't quite make it. Once you get enough threads engaged, it locks up. So we're gonna do another thousandth. That's it, just one more thousandth. This is what I wanted to show you before, but the threads were so loose, I couldn't. <laughs> so we're gonna go to 58 thousandths. Add a little lube. Engage the half nut, cut. You can tell how much faster the lathe's moving than normal when you're threading, because if I had to go in, there's no chance I'd be able to do this without crashing it. Oh, there we go. Boy, that's a perfect fit. Okay, there you go. That was threading to a shoulder without the risk of crashing. The trick is the only difference between that and normal threading in a, in a traditional fashion is to get a left-handed tool, put it upside down, make sure you get a smaller tool than your holder holds because trying to center it, trying to get it on the center of the, uh, uh, of the axis uh, is going to be hard because it's it's biased upside down. You might have to remove some material off the tool. I shimmed this one up and I used a tool that's two sizes smaller than the maximum size that fits on my lathe. And that seemed to work pretty well. So my tool's upside down. You run the lathe in reverse. All you do is you start from the inside. Start from the inside. You set a zero on either your indicator or your DRO to just give you a starting point each time. You dial in the cut either in the cross slide or you set your cross slide to zero and dial in with your compound, no different. With your lathe in reverse, you engage the half nut, cut the threads, and Bob's your uncle. This is extremely easy with no fear of crashing the tool into the work because normally that would be a big problem. Now, if you have to support your guy with a the center, then you know, you're back to risk on both sides, so maybe do it the traditional straightforward way. This is a pretty fantastic way to go. Works every time. Uh, I gotta thank Joe Pizinski who introduced me to this, and I just thought I'd share it with you as part of this series. Next up on this crazy journey, we're gonna discuss a topic that I have never done myself. This will be the first time, but I'm kind of interested in it, which is multi-start threads. So I know the some of the techniques to do it, and I'll discuss those with you, and hopefully we'll get a successful result. So first thing, a normal thread, the helix runs from one point at this end and progresses consistently with, as this thread goes all the way around the diameter, when it comes back, it will be touching the previous thread that you created and so-and-so across the whole thing. In a multi-start thread, you'll start a thread, say here, for a two-start thread, 
and the thread will go around. By the time it gets to this side, there's a whole empty space where an additional thread could fit in between it. And as it continues around, it will, all the way around, it will continue to have an empty space between the thread and itself. Then you start on this side and you create an additional thread and that thread runs in that empty spot in the first thread. So we have this set for a 24 pitch thread. We're going to do a multi start, which means if you want the pitch to be twice as wide so that a second thread can fit in between it, you have to set your lathe for 12 threads per inch. So I'm coming down here. I was at 24 threads per inch LBS 6V. I want to do 12. LBT6V, and I've got LBT6V here. Got it set for that. Okay, that's the first part. So cutting the thread for the first part of the thread is identical. Any, way, any method you use uh, will work. However, you notice that I've got my cross slide funny here. My cross slide is horizontal. So that is so I can hit the second start. Now there's multiple ways to do it. You don't have to do the cross slide method like I've got here. So I'm going to discuss the three options with you. One, you set a zero point on your gear here. And on the banjo, you loosen your banjo and you rotate your headstock. You set a line here, you rotate your headstock, or well, set a line where this, this gear meshes with this gear. You rotate it 180 for the second start. That's one solution. People with, that are used to doing change gears, this shouldn't be any problem for you. I never mess with the gears on this guy because I haven't needed to. Second solution. If you happen to be on a thread pitch that's other than this top section here, see this is 12? <laughs> 24 and 12 are both in any position, so this won't work for this method. However, if I had chosen, uh, let's see, 26 and 13, could you do it? Ah, here we go. So, 20, so if I had been 26 threads per inch, I want to do two start threads. So I'm down here at 13 threads per inch. It says I can start at any numbered position. So I do my first thread at any numbered position right here. And I do my second start half, half off, which would be the point in between the two numbered positions or vice versa. If I had done a 20 and it was start on any position, I would start it on a number on a whole number, and then, I'm not sure this part would work actually. I, I know that if you go in between and it started that it had to be on a specific spot, you go to the next spot, like if it's on a non-numbered position, then for the second start, you'd go for a numbered position. Uh, I don't know if that'll work if you start in any position going to number position, I'd have to try it to find out, but you get the idea. You use your thread gauge to go half, half out essentially. Next up is the method I'm going to use. You'll notice my compound is set at 90 degrees. Now I set it very carefully to be exactly 90 degrees. I've got it set to zero. I'm going to cut my first thread exactly normally. So I'm going to use the compound and go in, straight in, cut the thread to the full depth. When I'm done, I'm going to come back out. I'm going to start over and I'm going to move the compound over here one thread pitch for 24 threads per inch or half a thread pitch for 12 th threads per inch. And what that'll do is it'll line my ne next thread up right in the middle. So let's give this a shot. All right, so we're ready to go. So what I'm gonna do is I am just gonna do a scratch pass, a fairly deep one so that you can see the first thread and you will see that there's room for an entire second thread in between. Uh, where, where it runs. The spiral will be so wide that you could fit a whole nother thread in between it, which is exactly what we want. So we're going to go forward for this one and we're going to go in 20 thousandths. And since this thread I can start on any line, it does make it a bit easy. So you notice that the thread spacing is twice. As a quick check here, you'll notice that we are at 12 threads per inch. The stair gauge grabs. Now, notice how deep these threads are because 12 threads per inch, normally you would go in much, much farther because it's an equilateral triangle. So you're going to go in as deep as you are wide uh, along the sides. <laughs> you go in diagonally in as far as you are wide. But these threads, we want them to be the same as a 24 thread pitch uh, in, in dimensions, just spaced as if they're 12 threads. So that's what we've got here. All right, so we're going to continue with this thread now. And by the way, you can use the upside down tool method in reverse as well. It'll work equally well with this as it did with the uh, normal type single start thread.
And as you can see, the threads are a full depth 24 thread per inch thread spaced at 12 threads per inch. So now here's where the magic comes in. I take my compound, we're gonna e-stop the machine when we're in the middle of the thread, like right here. Okay, so now it's lined up and it shouldn't be touching the thread at all. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over one full thread pitch, and I believe it's for 24 threads per inch. So that would be 42 thousandths of an inch. So there's 10, 20, 30, 40, two thousandths. And as you will notice there, I don't know if you can see zoom, I don't know if I can zoom in enough, but maybe you'll notice that the cutting tool now is in between the other threads, exactly over 124 thread per inch thread pitch over, which puts it right in the middle of that empty spot. So we're gonna disengage the half nut. I'm gonna come back out here and then we're just gonna cut this thread like normal and not touch the compound again. And let's see if I'm right, because <laughs> I've never done this before. So we're gonna turn the lathe on. I'm gonna put a little bit of lube on there. We're gonna go in 20 thousandths for my first pass. I'm gonna engage the half nut on a whole line just like this because I'm using the cross slide to go in. And if I'm right, it should cut in between the other one. And sure enough, it has. So you'll notice right down the middle of that empty spot, I have run, I'm starting another thread. And then I just run it as usual. And all the, tr the only trick for the method I'm choosing is to take my cross slide and move it in one thread pitch on the second pass. Or if you're doing a three start pit, uh, three start thread pitch, then you pick a number that's divisible by three. So that 24 threads per inch I started with, I could have done this at eight threads per inch and had three starts and then dialed in one full thread pitch. That would have worked as well. Or you just need to make sure it's divisible. That's it. So now I'm going to continue and finish this thread. By the, reason, by the way, the reason this stuff's cutting so nicely is because this material is 12L14. The first stuff I was using was A2 tool steel and it doesn't cut as nicely at all. One thing to be aware of is you need to make sure that you go in the same depth on both or the threads won't look symmetrical. And it'll be really obvious because the eye is really good at picking out detail. So let's see if we can even tell the difference between the multi-start and the non-multi-start. So this thread threads in just fine. And this thread looks a lot like this thread from the side. This thread won't start because it advances twice as fast, which is why this is cocked to the side. Now, I don't know if you can see it here, so I'm gonna mark a start on this guy so that you can see. So here's one start. And if we go 180, you see another start right there. Hopefully you can see that. So. There's one start where I marked with the blue. And if I rotate 180, there's the other start. So this kind of thread advances twice as fast. It's very popular on things like bottle tops and cans because only maybe a quarter twist, they usually do like four start threads and six start threads so that maybe half a turn and you've disengaged all of the threads. It's pretty amazing because you can tell the lead on this the lead angle is twice the angle of the standard single start threads. And if I did a three start, it'd be three times the angle because it has to advance three times as fast to make room for two more threads in between in a three start, et cetera, et cetera. So there you go. Pretty successful. Well, that's it. That covers just about everything I know about threading. There might be something I missed, but I can't think of it. I tried to make this video all inclusive to help you out, especially if you're starting out. So let me know if there's anything you'd like to have seen. You know, maybe I'll do an update at some point in the future. This video was a tremendous amount of work, took me two weeks to make. So I hope you enjoy it. If you already know how to thread and there's 
maybe there's something in here like that whole upside down threading method where you, if you're threading up against a shoulder, you don't have to risk anything. I didn't do any uh, internal threading because it's essentially identical. And by the way, with internal threading, you can buy the opposite handed tool and do the inside to outside uh, internal threading solution exactly the same way you can do it on the outside. And I'd like to put another shout out to Joe Pizinski and thanks him, thank him for sharing that method on his channel. It was very useful and I learned a lot. Hopefully you did as well. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you next time.